Hello, my name is Decimus Claudius, and today I would like to welcome Pontifex Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus, who is currently serving this year as Idealis Curulus of Nova Roma. Besides his magistry, he fills several uh, smaller offices. Among them, the most important ones are Prefect of the Administration of the Republic, Curator of the Information Assets of Nova Roma, and uh, he's also the governor of Pannonia and a number of provinces that are under reorganization, which includes most of the European provinces. Uh, recently, he was elected, elected to the Senate at the completion of last year's census, and he holds uh, three distinctive titles or awards, the Corona Civica, which is the Civic Oak Crown, uh, awarded the title of Imperator, and also Princeps Juventutis, first among equestrians. Uh, thank you so much for um, taking the time and speaking with me today. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, first of all, um, I just wanted to let the viewers know that you and I had an interview um, in, f I believe, February of 2022, so uh, about a year and four months ago. And it was very interesting about two and a half hours or so. And um, I thought that since a bunch of time has passed and a, and a lot of things have occurred since then, that it would be nice to, you know, have a follow-up interview. And I'm really glad that uh, you found time today. Yes, indeed, lots of uh, things uh, happened since that time. So let's quickly jump in uh, to a few of those. Um, one of them is that you became senator after uh, many years of being involved in Nova Roma and the administration. Um, what was it like for you to um, make that jump? Wow, well, uh, it was an honor, first and foremost, uh, because um, the Senate is uh, uh, the leading body of Nova Roma and the people who are there are not just uh, administrative leaders, of our community, but are also one of the best and most dedicated Roman revivalists, reenactors, Latinists, um, history uh, admirers. Uh, so to be included in this August body is an honor. And I think I have uh, worked for, for, a, for a long time and, uh, and did uh, uh, a couple of things. So when when I arrived at this point, I felt that uh, it's not uh, uh, preposterous uh, for me to be included there. So it was it was a feeling of work well accomplished, job well done, and and it was a nice it was a nice feeling, an honor, and and a challenge too because uh, this will mean that I have to work. Uh, twice as hard as I have done previously. So it is a lot of responsibility. Speaking about working twice as hard, um, you spend a lot of time with Nova Roma. I mean, you go on events, you you write with me personally, you upload things on Facebook, you um, have so many things going on. It, it's really admirable to see how dedicated you are to Nova Roma and to Romanitas as well. Um, uh, th thank you very much. Well, really, this is, this is uh, most of most important thing in my life. This is something that uh, I have always dreamed of doing. So uh, I would not call it a hobby for me, for example. If it was just a hobby, probably I couldn't and wouldn't make this much effort but uh, since since i feel it as as a purpose in my life a mission to which i dedicated my life it just flows naturally a natural consequence that i have to spend all the time that i can afford unfortunately i can't afford all my time to be spent on the Roma, but but i try to spend as much as i can and if i could spend more i would <laughs> yeah because you do actually a lot of things sometimes just behind the scenes i mean you did you single-handedly 
plan the Conventus in Budapest, where um, a number of Nova Romans, not just from Hungary, but also internationally went? Or did you did you have a little help there? I had many helping citizens. I had actually I had a committee to uh, aid the organization. It was called the Conventus, uh, uh, no, Commissio Conventus Preparandi, which translates as uh, uh, Conventus Preparation Committee, in which six or seven people were involved who did various things uh, helping me and. And um, I am very grateful for those citizens. And without them, the Conventus wouldn't be the same success. I could name uh, some of them, but I don't want to leave out anybody who did a lot. So perhaps uh, without uh, previous thinking, I, I, I'm not going to detail the names, but I just want to make sure that it's well known that there are people who help me. They are helping Nova Roma, not just me, and not me in the first place, but Nova Roma and our events here. And and without them, I would be just a clown out there sh shouting things into the air. But with them, it's a orchestrated, beautiful event. So b before we get into the details of that, I also um, yeah I wanted to mention that um, other behind the thing behind the scenes things that you do is um, sometimes you speak with people from outside of Nova Roma with um, bringing in, I don't know, legions or speaking with uh, various notable reenactors to really, you know, grow the organization and um, to welcome, you know, people in open arms uh, across the world, actually. And I mean, Obviously, um, not everybody sees all, all the work that goes in, and it's very time-consuming, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it's it's very appreciated. One of the most important missions that I took upon myself is to to find and recruit the best modern Romans in the world and to integrate them into Nova Roma. This uh, can take sometimes years because I, I'm not proselytizing. I'm not... Uh, going to them like door-to-door uh, uh, -door agents that here is Nova Roma, join and everything will be wonderful. But uh, first, I have to, I intend to know them better, to form personal relationship. And after uh, we mutually like each other, we are friends. And it, when it naturally comes uh, into the discussion, I, I introduce our community and uh, and I make sure that uh, uh, the person understands who we are, what we do. And usually I let the person ask more. I don't want to push them to our joining, but, but I want them uh, to know us first. And if they like what we do, they like Nova Roma, then I'm very happy to answer more questions and and to introduce them and and eventually offer them the possibility of joining and and it can take sometimes years but it's sometimes just a day really for example in this conventus uh, uh, there were many people who not so many but a couple of people that's let's uh, let's not exaggerate there were a couple of people who heard about nova roma for the first time and they joined immediately the day they heard about nova roma it can happen because uh, for some people, this is exactly what they always wanted in an international community, which looks uh, beyond a simple reenactment group or a simple uh, one, one unit Roman group, but a community, a real Roman nation, so to speak, a real Roman nation with uh, fellow citizens, with uh, Senate, with uh, priesthoods, with legions, with provinces, the second Rome, the new Rome. That, that's what we intend to be, at least culturally speaking. Absolutely. Um, and a point, part of that is actually hosting events and also showing up to other people's events and making those connections. And if I recall correctly, um, you've been to three 
noteworthy international events this year. Uh, one in Rome, another one in Budapest, and then a third one recently in England. Am I missing out, or are, are those the are those the three that you've attended this year? I think that these are the three so far, but uh, just uh, one day later, two days late from today on Thursday. I will be leaving for the third, fourth, <laughs> for the fourth event, which will be in Tivoli, ancient oh, wow. Tibur, Tibur, Tivoli, Italy. I didn't hear about that. I will be presenting gladiatorial great games for the extended Ludi Florales, which is very long this year. But there are there are a couple of reasons why is it is so long this year, and it will be of course in honor of our 15th, uh, 15th anniversary. Oh, uh, 25th, 25th, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm always in trouble with numbers and speaking about in, in a foreign language. Uh, 25th anniversary. And it is actually part of a larger event, International, International Gladiators Championship. There will be several groups uh, fighting uh, um, contest in a contest with each other. And, and and the organizers will select a champion, the best gladiatorial group among the participants. It is it is intended to be a world championship of gladiatorial schools, modern gladiatorial schools. I'm not sure how many gladiatorial schools will be participating, not so many. So it's not really a true representation of, of the world's best uh, gladiatorial teams. But it is nice because it's international. There will be more than like a couple of groups, and 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 the intention is uh, very noble to bring them together. And uh, yeah, yeah, and and most importantly, I didn't name the group, the affiliated group of Nova Roma. It's the Familia Gladiatoria Pannonica. This is whom I am accompanying as Idilis Curulis, which is. Uh, one of my main jobs as ideal is Kurulis to present games. And part of it is to present online games, but, but a more important part of it is to present real, real life games like actual gladiatorial contests. And I remember, um, so back in April during the celebrations of the birthday of Rome, um, that uh, there is actually one member of uh, Nova Roma who very thankfully and um, actually, you know, behind the scenes organized uh, to transport all your equipment and I guess your toga because a toga takes up so much room in a bag, whereas a tunic could, you know, reasonably fit in a suitcase. But um, how are you transporting your your gear and, and your clothes this time? Or um, is somebody driving um, to transport it down there? Yes, yes. It is a different organization, different uh, infrastructure, different logistics this time. Because at that time, uh, mainly our 21st RAPAX group, Hungarian RAPAX group, which the current in the, in the current time, it really functions more as a civilian, Roman civilian reenactment groups uh, group. But um, the official name is uh, Legio Vicesima Prima Rapax, the twenty-first uh, Rapax Legion. This was and 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 this group didn't have uh, uh, co couldn't organize its own car, so we needed help. But the Familia Gladiatoria Pannonica, who who is now the group that is traveling there. Uh, loaned is it a good word or rented rented a car rented a car and uh, uh, it's actually a minibus so lots of things fit in equipment and i i intend to be too fast case fastest too fast case uh for two lictors and lots of things fit in the minibus it will be easy this time Amazing. And um, which group is organizing it? Because is this the Grupo Storio Romanico? I, I believe that's the name of it in Rome, or is it a different group that's organizing it? No, no. no it, it, this time, 
it is it is a friendly group to the Gruppo Storico Romano, but it is a, a Gruppo Storico Publio Elio Adriano, which is an Italian rendition of uh, Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian's name, Publio Elio Adriano. Gruppo Storico Publio Elio Adriano. There will be a couple of members of the Gruppo Storico Romano present at this event, and uh, and a number of Nova Roman citizens among them from Italy. I think maybe in total 20 Nova Roman citizens will participate in this event, a number of whom are Hungarians and some of them are Italians. And there will be even an Australian and a Tulian citizen. Wow. Tule is uh, Scandina Scandinavia, a Swedish uh, friend, a Swedish, Swedish citizen which is our Provincia Tule. Have you visited Hadrian's Villa before or will it be your first time there? Um, sorry, I, uh, I, there was no sound for a second. What, what did I visit? Uh, have you been to Hadrian's Villa before or will it be your first time there? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I believe we won't visit Hadrian's Villa this time. I'm afraid, but I have been there, uh, like uh, about uh, 2005, maybe 2005. Oh, okay, so, okay, it so it's in Tivoli, time. but not on the grounds of the villa. Yes, it is in the city. Oh, okay. There is an amphi amphitheater. It's called the amph Amphitheatro di Blaiso, Blaisus's amphitheater, and this is where the event takes place. And there will be a small procession within the city. So we will leave. Uh, the amphitheater, and we march around the main streets of Tivoli. Oh, wow. That'll be very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it will be spectacular, yes. So speaking about events, um, let's just jump right into it. Um, uh, the So the first one that we mentioned uh, was in Rome back in April, and um, there were quite a number of Roman Nova Roman citizens there, among many other reenactors from many other countries. Um, the, the pictures looked absolutely amazing, obviously marching by the, the Colosseum and monuments must have been a very special experience, one, one that you've had before several times. But um, how, uh, was this like maybe your third time there? Because I, I think you've done it a few times already. And no, how was this no. experience? I only participated in the Natale di Roma, as they call it, the Pom, which is, the proper name is the Parilia Festival, Parilia uh, celebration. The Natale di Roma is the Italian for the birthday of Rome. Uh, the festival was called Parilia in the antiquity, or sometimes they refer to it as the Natalis Romae, which is the same as Natale di Roma, the birthday of Rome. And that it was my, se it was my second time only. I only participated two times in, in this festival and parade in Rome. However, I have been in Rome like 10 times and uh, and uh, met there Nova Roman fellow citizens. So uh, an event in Rome, that is my, not the second time, but multiple time. Uh, however, my, my uh, participation in this specific uh, festival is just the second. So how does it feel to to march by the, these ancient monuments? And also um, on the pictures, it was a very bright day. I mean, like, w was it hot? Was it a very tiring day? Absolutely. It was excruciating. It was, <laughs> it was terribly hot. I don't, I don't like hot very much. Uh, I don't say I'm a no northern man. I'm not, but, but, uh, I just don't. I just don't like the very hot climate, and 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 I I felt, and not just me. Many of others complained. Uh, it was uh, life saving that there was a guy uh, in the Quarto da Chimani group, our affiliated legion, who walked around uh, between the soldiers and offered them water. So, without uh, such little helps. So, uh, maybe someone would have passed out. It was not oh, wow. uh, so far from that point that it was so hot there. And um, but 
obviously marching uh, in the streets uh, across the Forum Romanum, Colosseum, the Capitoline Hill, and uh, Palatine. This is uh, for, for people like us who really adore Rome, live for Rome. It's, it's the best thing to ever happen. These, these are the moments for which we work continuously. This is the ideal state of being, ideal state of mind, ideal situation that we can be in Rome, in our traditional Roman clothing, doing Roman things, using Latin words, phrases. Uh, so I think it's the superlative of uh, Roman, living Romanitas. So that's very special. And, and um, I was very happy that Nova Roma could have been there in such a great numbers with so many fine people and which was absolutely unique and 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 uh, wonderful that both consuls participated in this event and they led our uh, march which comprised like um, 70 people maybe 80 80 70 people not all of them were no, not all of them were no roman citizens but uh, at least half of them and with the full set of electors, if I recall correctly. Yes. yes, this this was also a big first. I have never seen any picture, or I never heard that anyone have assembled 12 lictors and two consuls in Rome in form of a reenactment. But within Nova Roma, which makes it even more special that although it's not like completely a real state, a real nation, but the closest that one can get in, to that in the 21st century, since our consuls uh, are really elected by the people, by thousands of members, and they are really the presidents of a Roman country. And, and everything works in Nova Roma according to the Roman system. So it's not just a setup for the day, like in a theater, but it is something that has been working uh, for 25 years and it culminated in that moment where where two consuls uh, uh, march in Rome with 12 lictors its fellow citizens so it was it was a I I, I consider it a big success perhaps the nicest moment of this uh, anniversary year and I, I do have to say it's actually a big honor um, for that group to invite Nova Roma to come. And um, I, I'm not sure how many years Nova Roma has been officially marching there, but I mean, it, it's very nice when, um, to, to get that invitation and also to see so many uh, Nova Romans march under the banner together. I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't because <laughs> the next weekend I was in Turkey visiting Roman sites, which I find such a shame because it would have been amazing to actually get to know so many Nova Romans all at the same time. But obviously there are events in the future that I, you know, I could make up. But um, so for instance, uh, I'm sure that organizing starts well in advance. Is that something that any Nova Roman who has the proper attire uh, is allowed to join? Yes, yes, naturally. Yes, it's a very, very free event. Uh, and while you are absolutely correct that it is an honor for Nova Roma to be invited, but this is the most open event maybe in the reenactment, Roman reenactment world. So uh, it's not, not an invitation based. You just um, send a statement of... Uh, intention that you want to participate and and then you are in so there is no selection of groups everyone can participate who has a relatively acceptable uh, appearance but that's very 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 low the 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 requirements are very are very low and uh, for example this year i saw pictures of uh, darth vader and uh, 
and some uh, Star Wars troopers marching. Oh wow! In half Roman or some, there was some kind of Roman element in their in their clothing. But so obviously they are put aside from the real reenactors, and and they come at the end of the of the parade. So there is no mix up with between real Roman groups and and these um, um, how to put it uh, carnival carnival uh, mascara groups. So so there there is a differentiation, but uh, but it's really really not uh, uh, working based on selection and invitation. But everyone can participate. It's the intention of the organizers to include all people who love Rome, include all all who feel a desire to be there and to honor the birthday of Rome. So it's a very, very inclusive event. Our first participation was in 2018, officially as a group of Novo Roma. However, our affiliated groups participated more than this. So I I haven't counted how many times Novo Roma was there with affiliated groups, but probably eight, eight, ten times, eight, ten times during our history. However, they, Nova Roma wasn't mentioned among the participants. Only just two times were we mentioned in 2018 and this year. Yeah, I mean, I've actually never, I've, I've gone to many um, events and festivals when, when it comes to Roman reenactments, but I've actually never actively participated. So I'm not sure if that would be, uh, you know, the first ideal event for me, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, I have another 10, 10 and a half months or so before it occurs again. So um, just uh, to finish, to wrap up, um, what was the actual route? Like, because I've seen pictures in, in the circus. So, I mean, is that where you started or where you ended in the Circus Maximus? Both, both. The Circus Maximus was the place of the festival. The camps of the groups were in the Circus Maximus. Uh, the performances or rituals or various um, shows that the reenactors put on were all in the Circus Maximus, mo most of them, overwhelmingly. And, and the procession, the big parade, uh, started out from the Circus Maximus and, and it went uh, uh, around the Forum Romanum and the Colosseum and Palatinus um, from the direction of uh, the theater of Marcellus and uh, then toward the Piazza Venezia through the Via dei, Fu dei Fori Imperiali, Via dei Fori Imperiali to the Colosseum and then uh, I don't know which is what is the modern name of the that street, but it was the triumphal triumphal uh, way, perhaps the end of the Via Appia, from the Colosseum to the Circus Maximus. Okay, great. And it must have been really fun to just see all these crowds on both sides of the road. Yes, yes, sure. It was encouraging because they were usually very friendly. They cheered and encouraged us. But uh, for me, at least, because I, I, I'm, a, I'm an organizer, organizer and, and I have to make sure that we look well. Our formation is keeping together. Everybody marches in his place, in her place. The flag is upheld nicely. The consuls are looking in the correct direction, the lictors behavior. So for me, it was just constant monitoring, checking everything. So while in part of one part of my brain, I could enjoy it, it was really just a very, very exhausting uh, task of constant monitoring, checking, and being nervous about uh, all the details. So yeah, but not, not the word fun wouldn't even cross my mind as a fun event. It was an extremely exhausting, uh, very, very laborious, tiring, uh, excruciating day. And if I think back, I feel satisfaction and joy for the success and pride and, and, and happiness for its successful completion. I don't feel that 
physically, actually, I enjoyed any second during the entire thing. Probably physically, in in the moment, I didn't enjoy anything, but but I enjoy it as an as an achievement and looking back. But I'm sure, and I know that many of the people who participated enjoyed it because they told me so. So and this that that was my job, that others enjoy it, and and if others enjoyed it, I'm enjoying it afterwards. And another example of your service is actually. Um, af- I believe it was afterwards, you actually gave a uh, tour of Rome to various p- participants from Pannonia, some of whom have never been to Rome before. So instead of, I don't know, going off and seeing maybe a museum or some place that you haven't, or just, you know, relaxing, you, you, went, uh, you went and you were a tour guide. Yes, yes, but it was not just afterwards the parade, but uh, there were there were sections in each day that was kept uh, aside for city touring and we did uh, the forum romanum and the palatine after the parade but we did uh, other parts before before that day for example the campus martius campus mar how do you pronounce it in campus martius campus martius and campo martio in italian or, or the Colosseum, for example, it was another day as well. So, yeah, I, I think that this was another uh, thing that many of our participants enjoyed, especially those who were there for the first time. So I'm very happy that we could make that. It's very important. It, it, it's, a, it's an important learning possibility and getting to know Rome in first person is uh, is one of, was one of one of the mo- most important goals of this uh, roman mission roman project so let's uh, jump to events now and um so recently um actually it wasn't even a month ago i believe that uh, the conventus in budapest took place it actually yes. supposed to occur or it was supposed to take place several years ago, but due to Corona, um, it couldn't take place. And coincidentally, um, it took place in the the 25th year, or sorry, the 25th anniversary of uh, Nova Roma. So um, how is that like for you um, organizing uh, this event um, coinciding with the 25th uh, anniversary? Again, I just uh, can repeat myself that it was it was a great uh, honor because uh, uh, it was very special that I could be the host of such an important conventus, which not only celebrates the community coming together, but it also celebrates the 25 years of the existence of this community. Uh, but again, as I previously said, it was for me it was work. Mostly, yes, of course, I did. There were moments I enjoyed, and but it comes enjoyment comes afterwards. If I look back on the days, and I and I can say that we didn't uh, do any major mistakes. Uh, everything uh, went well. People were satisfied, and then I I have to account in my conscience uh, occasional errors, mistakes, or um, delays, or little problems but when i make this final um, review in my head and if i can say the balance is for the positive then i can enjoy it so after the commentus i really uh, spent some uh, happy days knowing that it was a successful event absolutely i mean there were people that came there from the us ukraine yes. czech republic yes um, and, and those are just the individuals that I'm aware of. Of course, you know, a lot more people arrived. And um, so if, if you don't mind, could you just, you know, kind of briefly take us, you know, day by day or event by event during the uh, Conventos? Yes. Um, it lasted from Tuesday, uh, Thursday to uh, Tuesday the next week. And it started with an opening in front of the National Museum of Hungary, which you visited as well, and where you met for the first time. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this was a little opening ceremony in modern. Most of our members were in modern clothes, but some some of us were in Roman clothes. And I offered a little ritual, just two three minutes. And my colleague Idilis Flavius Stilico and I, uh, and the consul Quintus Arius Nauta, the three of us, uh, opened uh, the conventus. And it was very nice to do this in front of this large Roman style building, which looked exactly like a, a Roman temple. For example, the temple temple of Venus and Roma in Rome would uh, uh, be similar to that in size and and appearance. And um, it was also connected to an to a university event. This opening, there was an open day in the university, which is exactly nearby the Hungarian National Museum, and a small Nova Roman uh, uh, presence was there with a with the stand, uh, some of our soldiers from the cohorts Sexta Carpatica, uh, also known as Colonia Rostalo, our Burgus were there. So in total, I think 15 citizens or so were present at, the, at this opening. And then we went to the museum and saw, watched some uh, parts of, the, of, of, mostly the Roman part of, of the display at the museum. The next day was the preparations day, Friday, when we uh, prepared everything to be brought into the site of the Equincum, ancient Equincum, which is a which is an archaeological archaeological park today of the Equincum Museum. And this conventus was integrated with the Equincum Museum's Floralia, which is traditionally also the main event of every Nova Roma Floralia since the early 2000s. And uh, it was purposefully, this commentus was purposefully organized that it could be at the same time, same place where the Floralia is, because then our visitors and, and citizens who come together can participate in some magnificent and actually interesting uh, experience like the Aquincum Floralia. But uh, it also caused a side effect that things are very, very hectic because we have had to make sure that we can properly present our program programs in this festival. So the, the advantage of such conventus organized in a festival is that that we can actually produce something and, and photos can be made of it and it can be made in it, they, it this can made it to the news and uh, and and the entire thing seems like a huge and magnificent uh, uh, program. The downside is that people are really working. So it's not like you are just laying down and talking with each other, but but everybody has a task and you have to stand here, do this, do that. Uh, it's, it's like going to a job. <laughs> so S Saturday and Sunday was uh, basically a job for the participants to make sure that the Aquincum Floralia gets its programs because we had important rules, roles in there to fill. Um, so Friday was spent with the organization and preparation for that. And Saturday and Sunday were the days of the Aquincum Floralia on site, on location among the ruins of Aquincum. Now this time for the, in honor of the Conventus, we had the huge and magnificent camp, perhaps the biggest camp that Nova Roma has ever had. It was a combined uh, effort of the Legio Vicesima Prima Rapax of Hungary and uh, Colonia Rostallo and uh, uh, Legio uh, Quarta Decima Comitatensis, also known as the Quarto Decimani of Flavius Stilico and the Just Terra a quick question. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, when you say a camp, are, do you mean a so a Roman camp with, for instance, the the leather cowhide tents in the ancient Roman style? No, there were no leather tents, but uh, textile tents, textile tents only. But it was legionary in in nature. Even the civilian tents were legionary style, because there are no civilian tents really, or there is. For all the civilian groups usually 
set up military camps because camping is not a civilian thing to do. Civilians should be in the in the in the houses, but those are those no longer exist. And in locations where th those are restored, like in Karnuntum, uh, the reenactors cannot live and be there inside it, the buildings uh, as as they are place of station as their place of stay they can go inside for a performance but they cannot camp <laughs> they cannot uh, stay in in the reconstructed uh, uh, replica houses so basically it's uh, only military this is why there is no really other form of reenactment than military because because reenactors always have to set up a, a camp and if you set up a camp it it already starts to look like military and if you have a camp then it always comes handy to have one at, or at least two so soldiers as guards so each military group almost immediately starts to involve some soldiers i said military group each reenactment group is what i meant to say each reenactment group has at least some military com component so back back to the story, uh, we had a huge uh, camp, and I was just listing which groups uh, contributed to this. We actually had two camps. If the, if we co combined the two camps, it was about 20, 20 tents in total, and but not all of them were Nova Romans. For example, we had the guest legion from Romania, uh, the Sexta Ferrata, Legio Sexta Ferrata. And they are not uh, members, not even affiliates. They are just, they are just a group who were participating in the Floralia. But one of our member groups, uh, the Legion of Nova Roma, which is called uh, uh, Cohors Sexta Carpatica, uh, camped together and participated together with that Legion. So they increased uh, our appearance, our numbers. So it was huge, absolutely marvelous, and. And our other camp, which was uh, more civilian in nature, where my where the chief tent of Nova Roma, the, the the commander tent of Nova Roma, was set up, that too also comprised like eight tents in total, and uh, it was put to built put together by four groups of Nova Roma, if I count correctly. So it was real, really big international cooperation with many groups together, uh, all, all for Nova Roma. So this was uh, on Saturday and Sunday. In both days, we had a big opening ceremony, main, the main sacrifice, main celebration of, of the goddess Flora, which is the central theme of the Floralia. It involves a procession uh, on the ruined cities of Aquincum, all of the groups, the legions and civilians, march together. In front of them march the 12 lictors. After that, the two consuls and senators and magistrates and priests of Nova Roma. Uh, we were uh, followed by our flags, three flags of Nova Roma, and, and the flags of our affiliated groups, then our affiliated legions, then other groups, other legions, and then the barbarians, some barbarian groups also participate. There was a huge procession. It led to uh, the old museum building, which looks like a Roman temple. So we used it as a substitute for a Roman temple. And, and the consuls and priests and magistrates, senators, ascended the stairs of this um, temple, where an altar with fire and smoke in it was already prepared. We chanted the formula prayers. We prayed for the 25th anniversary of Nova Roma for our growth, for the success of our mission, and for the success of the event, for the Aquinco Museum as well, and all the reenactment groups and friends and associated partners and, and other groups present there. And then um, basically that was that was the main the culmination. And afterwards, during the day, there were various smaller pro 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 programs like gladiatorial games and uh, fashion show, Roman style, Roman fashion presentation. Um, we had uh, a section 
among us. It's called the Lumen Mundi, who had a permanent stand and they showed Roman cosmetics and Roman female accessories and all kinds of things that uh, uh, is a very uh, is le less known and is, is less presented to the audience. And uh, we we held the Latin school, forty minutes, learn Latin from zero to the basics. This is this was a program I held, and uh, I distribute uh, flyers, um, little summaries of the basics of Latin grammar, and we spend forty minutes with the audience. And we learn to compose simple sentences like, uh, hello, how are you? Give me the bread. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm, thirst I'm thirsty. Uh, this is a sword. It is a very nice sword. Uh, whose sword is this? So it's these kind of simple short sentences, which is always a success because people don't expect to compose Latin sentences from zero uh, starting from zero in 40 minutes, but it's possible. It is, it is just a question of um, presentation. How do you select the words? How do you break down the grammars in just to those simple things that will be needed to form those sentences? So people enjoy this. Let's see what else did we have. There was a bottle. Of course, it's always there is always a bottle, <laughs> and um, between. Romans and barbarians. Uh, just the top of my head. This is what I, came to my mind. Yes, your questions. No, well, I I want to say I also saw uh, some pictures of people selling items, such as Stilico, who was selling Posca there. Yes, um, yes. he had a very nice stand. Yes, it's a very important project of our idealis and the proquestor of Germania. Uh, Stilico, who is now also the commander of the late Roman groups of Nova Roma, ceremonial position mostly. It depends how the groups want him to be involved in their business, but ceremonially he has become the commander, the legatus proprietoria or late Roman units of Nova Roma. And he started this Posca project. Uh, he launched it last year in Aquincum actually. And now he came with a ten, with a stand, the Le, Legio Legio Posca stand, which was part of our camp, and and uh, uh, it was a big um, success. People were interested and they enjoy the taste of the Posca. It seems to be very popular, and and um, it, it's very it's a very good thing that in Nova Roma we can help promote it as part of our mission. Absolutely. I spoke to him just a few weeks ago on a live Twitch stream. And there I uh, tried it for the very first time. And it was really interesting um, because, I mean, just to go from an idea in one's head to tens of thousands of um, a Posca, you know, being made and distributed is quite an amazing achievement and it and it's also very tangible i mean people could um so obviously you could open up a cookbook and you could cook some roman items but i mean in terms of drinks pasca you know modern day pasca you know just wasn't accessible before and obviously uh the other major drink, wine, is a pretty <laughs> readily accessible. That you know, maybe you don't even, cons you know, think about the ancient Greeks or Romans drinking wine anymore. So Pasca is definitely something that uh, I, I see a good future with uh, in in Roman events. Um, I really like the taste. I I actually wrote to you about it if you if you tried it there, and I think you told me that you've tried it maybe twenty times already. <laughs> Yes, several times. I actually in inaugurated the first official uh, can of Posca in Aquincum. I have the or Aboriginal can. It is in it is in our place here. So I, Flavius Trico gave it to me to to um, keep it uh, to protect it as a some kind of uh, token, some kind of um, relic. So I keep it in uh, high esteem, 
and uh, when it will become a big success i i will be happy that i can have the first official can well i mean success is always relative but from what i've seen it's already become a success yes yes indeed it is already been spoke spoken of by many and I don't believe there are many reenactor, Roman reenactors in the world who don't know about it. And by Roman reenactor, I mean Romanists, Roman enthusiasts who observe, follow Roman events. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, the official launch was actually in Rome in April. Um, so did you see many people drinking um, the Pasca there as well? Yes, yes, yes. I saw many, many like groups forming around the Posca tent and and people were very curious and they liked it. it but it's everywhere the same there is it's every everywhere a big hit definitely and i also saw that there's um uh so he's shipping to to europe so not not yet to north america or asia or australia but to europe right now and he just uh i believe launched his website a few days ago, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. yes so, yes. I mean, I'm definitely excited about that. And um, I also heard that in the on one of the days in the Conventus, it actually rained. Yes, unfortunately, um, bo on both uh, days of the Floralia um, period of Floralia part of the Conventus, uh, it rained, but uh, it was not a problem on Saturday. It was very light rain and and it ceased and there were long long uh, sections of time when there was no rain at all but on on sunday afternoon the rain basically eliminated most of the outdoor programs but fortunately we could held the main uh, ceremony which was the most important and then the other events could be held uh, in, within the museum, build, museum building. Some of the programs have had to be cancelled, but uh, uh, it didn't uh, involve our programs. Have you ever been to uh, a Roman reenactment where it rained so hard that everything just had to stop? Yes, I have been an event which didn't even start. It was in Hungary, in Villa Romana Balaza, Balaza. Uh, there is a Roman villa there, uh, and the village is called Balaza. Balaza. So the mod it's a modern compound name from the fact that there is a villa there, Villa Romana, uh, and and the modern place name is Balaza. We don't know the Roman place name, and um, we were supposed to hold a very uh, nice. Uh, Two day long festival but it couldn't even start because it because the rain started so heavily uh, before the opening of the programs that visitors didn't come and we couldn't do anything so it was quite unfortunate but i don't remember any other events that were so fully incapacitated by the rain it was the first ever floralia which was uh, seriously hindered by rain but luckily only a small part of it. So I still uh, don't consider this Floralia washed away by the rain. <laughs> we, we could hold 70% of, of the programs. And if I'm not mistaken, you were also very generous in welcoming some of the international uh, guests, or well, not guests, but international participants in your actual, in your own home. I mean, that must have been an interesting few days right there. Yes, yes, we were packed. <laughs> there were people sleeping in all coaches and, and on the uh, floor and everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you can't get much more Roman than that, spending, you know, the morning, evening and night with other fellow Romans. Yes, it was nice. It was nice. Not the... Uh, um, completely comfortable, but comfortness was uh, uh, substituted by enthusiasm and and a sense of mission and accomplishment. And it's also interesting because 
uh, I think some of the people um, individually have never met each other. So it was a, you know, definitely a good time to form connections. Yes. But some of them have met, not once. And it's interesting that they can meet, for example, Scholastica and Hortensia met in the United States like 15 years ago. And now they met in in my home in Budapest in Hungary. So it, it is um, amazing and and funny to think that how people from different countries, uh, different parts of the world, after so many years came together in a seemingly impossible scenario. Definitely. I mean, it sounds like actually a huge success. Obviously, um, it would have been nice, you know, if the Conventus would have taken place several years ago to, you know, have a more frequent rhythm. But I mean, Corona obviously just got in the way of many people's plans and lives and what have you. So, I mean, it, it's it's nice that it happened now. It's not something that happens every year. Um, I think would. you said it was the eighth. It was the eighth Conventus ever in the 25 years of Nova Roma. It's difficult to organize. It, it is a lot of effort and uh, lots of money are invested on part of the organizers, usually. And uh, well, there is always the risk that uh, if it's not well timed, not well marketed, and not well thought out, there will be there will be very few international guests, especially overs from overseas. And this is another consideration that sometimes people just cannot risk uh, to start organizing it if there is no enough uh, confirmation that there will be people in sufficient numbers coming to it from many countries. If it was and just limited the- in Hungary, we could hold a convent every second month because we have a hundred citizens here. So we, if we if we wanted, we could. Uh, uh, create the appearance of a large conventus, but it wouldn't be true because it would be just a provincial meeting. The essence of the conventus is that uh, many countries, many provinces participate in it. Yeah, and um, there are also, um, depending on the nationality, some people need to get a visa to... um you know, go to the U.S. or go to Hungary or to go to England. So um, there are also, you know, that consideration that, you know, people need need time to to really commit to going. So um, I'll, de- I'll definitely be looking out for the next Conventus. And obviously a year hasn't been announced. A location hasn't been announced. I mean, there's, you know, that's down the road, but I'll, there, there I are rumors definitely... already that the next location is going to be Nova Britannia, New England, United States. There are plans, there are there are ideas flying around about that by the locals. So maybe the next one will be in Nova Britannia, uh, in some part of uh, New England, USA. And um, uh, that would be the first ever American conventus. I mean, there were lots of American conventions and local meetings and even countrywide, USA-wide uh, gatherings. But officially, uh, no, the Conventus is an institution. And in this institution, so far, only European provinces uh, uh, participated. I mean, as organizers. Yeah. Well, ob- obviously, if the Conventus is in Hungary, it's kind of cost prohibitive for some Americans to fly over. And obviously if it's in, if it's in New England, it's cost prohibitive for people from Hungary or Australia or Turkey or all these countries to fly over. So, I mean, it, it's gonna happen regardless of location. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a big uh, problem, this, this distance between the USA and Europe, unfortunately. I hope and and I, I really root for the, the organizers in, in the USA and and it is my wish, but of course it will be upon to the organizers that it should be organized around some kind of uh, Roman event, 
so that it is not just modern and not just uh, going into restaurants and museums and talking in a hotel lounge, lounge, lounge or how do you say that word? Lounge. Uh, yes, yes but, but there should be some kind of Roman event like the Floralia. I don't mean that size because I know it's more difficult in the United States to, to find such event, but there are events. We have affiliated legions there. I'm, I may be incorrect, but, but uh, I think that there are even two affiliated legions in Nova Britannia, so it should be possible. And and uh, we will see, we will see. I will give all my support and and whatever I can to the locals from here, that few, which I can. And depending on, on the location in Nova Britannia, I mean, there are some excellent museums there with the Roman items. Like for instance, in New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, if in Yale, they have an amazing collection, especially items yes. from Syria. Then you go to Boston, wonderful fine arts museum. And also in, um, in Harvard, uh, university they also have a wonderful museum. So, so there's plenty of Roman elements um, in terms of museums that could also be incorporated. Yes, of course. Now let's go. So we spoke a lot about uh, two events. Let's uh, jump into the third, and that was uh, very recently in uh, the UK. So um, I actually don't know much about it. Um, so I would love to hear, you know, um, just what happened and who was there. And um, f first, let's start with the location. I, I believe it was in Wrexham, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. It is Northern Wales. And um, we have an affiliated legion there. It's called the Legio Vicesima Valeria Victrix, the 20th Valeria Victrix Legion. Uh, and its commander is uh, uh, Aulus uh, Ocratius Maximus Gittus. Uh, his worldly name is, his mundane name is uh, Paul Harston. And it was his uh, vision for decades to create a Roman fortress. Uh, actually, it was originally his father's vision. And, and the family had uh, done so much effort for so many years to make it a reality just to obtain the permission for for the area to build there it was many many years of fights so they they are very very dedicated and and it's it's their lifelong dream so uh the entire life of of these people is put into this and their livelihood uh, their money uh, all their free time so it's wonderful wonderful what they what they sacrifice and did to make this happen and and this uh, our affiliated legion there built uh, ba first for both a wonderful picturesque uh, piece of land with a very nice little um not river how do you call it a very little just a, a stream for Stream, yes, a wonderful little romantic looking, lovely stream. Uh, the entire entire area is uh, covered with forests and uh, little hills. So it's it's wonderful. It, it's out in the nature and, and they bought this uh, little piece of land. It's not, not so little, it's actually a huge piece of land. And in a higher point of it, as it would be in Roman times, they started to build Roman wooden built forests, for for fortress, for not forest, fortress, and um, much of it's already re already done. So the walls are done. There are two, one one uh, permanent building is set up. The other build in in place of the other buildings, there are tents for the time being, but. They intend to build up the entire thing as a permanent fortress, not a camp forest, but a but a station, a, like a military city, as it was. It's modeled on a real, actual excavated fortress. Uh, the design, the buildings, everything is done according to 
what has been found nearby in an excavation. The actual spot in which it is built was Roman, Roman area, of course, and there can be found Roman items in the ground. So it, it is it is actually a piece of land which was uh, tramped on by Roman soldiers, Roman citizens in the antiquity. And, and the original fortress is just a few hundred uh, meters, maybe some miles away from this location. So it couldn't be more real than that. And the program was, uh, I think, nine days long, eight days long. I didn't uh, participate in the full length of the programs, just in the first four days. And uh, But it was the most important because that was the part when we inaugurated the fortress. According to Roman ceremony, we gave it the name. We marked out the land as a symbolical possession of Nova Roma. It's not actual possession. It's it's not owned in any form, or there is no any claim on, from the side of Nova Roma of ownership. It's it's part of Nova Roma as part of our nation, as part of our symbolic uh, Roman community, symbolic Roman Republic. And the name was given to the fortress as Castra Ovum, after the father of Gittus, the founder, who first. Uh, uh, phrased first uh, uttered the dream that a Roman fortress should be built in which people can go in and actually experience what was it to be like a Roman soldier 2000 years ago he, his nickname the father of the founder Gittus is the founder's father's nickname was Egg in English and Egg in Latin is Ovum so this is how the name of the camp the name of the fortress was uh, decided as the Egg Fortress, Castra Ovum. And um, afterwards, there were various other programs like bat battle between Romans and barbarians, uh, campfire in nights with drinking and singing and eating a lot. Uh, there were gladiatorial games. Um, various smaller rituals to mark certain moments and points of the day. And we had our praetor, praetor, Gaius Petronius Turpilianus, Gaius Petronius Stephanus Turpilianus. There. Gaius Petronius uh, is our vice president of the international community of Nova Roma, praetor. And uh, he was the guest of honor or the pa patron of the event, so to speak, because he was the highest officer. And as governor of uh, Britain, I was uh, the other patron or other um, presiding officer at the event. Uh, we had um, also recruited a le new legion there for uh, Provincia Tracia, Trachia, the Legio Prima Italica. It was unexpected. It was it just happened as the as the talks went on in the in the fortress and and there was such a good atmosphere and sense of camaraderie friendship that this legion uh, expressed their wish to be part of Nova Roma. Some members of it were already citizens. To to this part of the story that it was easy it was easy to make this uh, step if uh, some of the leaders were already citizens, but then there was a co consensus of the group that they want to be part of the wider Roman revival movement, Nova Roma. Uh, yeah, I think I think I sum summarized everything. I am now open Ooh. for any detailed questions. Was it, was was the event open to the public, or was it just closed to uh, Roman reenactors? It was open to the public. Uh, the night programs uh, were not because there was an opening closing time so there were sections of our day which for us only uh, but um, all of the important programs were open nice i've actually only heard of wrexham because 
um, of the soccer team. They have a, I believe they have two owners that are Hollywood actors and they, you know, bought the team and they promoted it. They just reached promotion. And um, that's why Wrexham has been in the news a lot. Although I've, I've never been there and I don't think I've actually heard of the city until um, a, a year or so ago. Um, how did you actually get there? With the uh, airplane. There's an airport there? Not in Wrexham. Uh, I went to uh, Manchester and from Manchester, okay. Gittus, the, the commander of the Legion, uh, brought me and some others because there were other guests from Italy and Spain, Roman reenactors, and they also became the Roman citizens during this event, so now our fellow citizens. Um, w uh, arrived at Manchester and Gittus uh, uh, collected us together and, and in a minibus he drove us into the fortress. Nice. Is the fortress, well, obviously it's on private property, but um, are there future events or if somebody wants to check it out, they, they write them an email and they, they organize a day and time or, or how does that work? Well, there will be events organized by by the founders the owners and there and it will be open for renting for other events for like weddings or parties or for other groups to hold their camps exercises training or whatever history camps it will be a commercial possibility business op possibility for 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 the funding organization and it will be also used as a history festival site for various groups, including ours and others. Uh, the, the company which um, formally owns this property and, and the camp is Park in the Past. This is, this is a tourist um, history called historical touristical society which organizes uh, reenactment events and city tours uh, in the location in, in the in the wider area and uh, educational programs for children for children for school for tourists city festivals and all sorts of things and so they have practice and many years of uh, established contacts and 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 uh, and lots of experience how to do this so it is in very good hands it's amazing i mean i'm really glad that you know all these different events and just opportunities for people to come together just you know exist and um obviously it takes a bit of initiative and planning but um yeah it's amazing um so you also so those are the three in the past you mentioned the one um, event that you're going to in Tavoli. Um, are there any other events planned for later this year? Yes, after Tivoli, there will be the nights of the the night of the museums, and I will go to the Villa Romana Balazza, which I already mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, and there will be uh, the festival in Carnuntum, and then there will be. In August, and there will be another festival in Carnuntum in September, and there will be the Savaria Carnival in um, in um, in um, in the end of September. When there will be a, an event in Yasi, Rom Romania, Dacia Provincia in July, if I'm correct, and of course the October Horse in October uh, in Hungary in Budapest. Phew, that's just out of the top of my head. So this, I, it's a very busy year because I'm idealist, so I, I do more than usually. Not every year is so busy for me in regards to fe festivals, but it's it's the job of the idealist to be to to put on games and spectacles, and I take it very seriously. And I could have been idealist many years ago. It, it's not not so difficult to uh, obtain a magistracy in Novaroma, but I waited for the time when I actually have the means and opportunities and connections to make it so that it is really meaningful in many different ways 
for Novaroma and for the wider audience, the, the world, our that which we serve because we are not just for ourselves. We, we are a service to the world. We are the service to the to the people of the world who want to learn about Roman history, religion, arts, literature, clothing, architecture, or whatever. Definitely. And also in the past, I mean, for instance, there were various games and events um, uh, that were held online. And one thing that you've done is actually you've made a bunch of these events in person. So instead of having, you know, a, a virtual gladiator um, battle, uh, you would actually have real ones and you, you would record it and post it and items like that. So, I mean, it, obviously a lot of people appreciate, you know, all your efforts that you put into it. And, and I didn't emphasize it, uh, but it just came to my mind. I, I, did, I couldn't put on online the video of the, our first real life chariot race. But this year, in honor of our 25th anniversary, we had our first real life chariot race. Just completely real with three chariots in Gorsium. And it is in honor of the Floralia and our 25th anniversary games. And oh, I. The problem is that it's a lot, lot of work to. It is a lot of work to edit these videos and to add them subtitles and uh, music and all sorts of things. And I, I couldn't find just three days in a row since March that I can sit down and make the edits. <laughs> this happened in April, not in March, but the series of games started in March. And since March the 1st, I don't really have time for anything. So, I mean, a real life chariot race, I mean, that's absolutely amazing. I, I've seen some pictures, for instance, I believe it was in so Tunisia and another country in North Africa. Um, that that would you know host chariot games for the public. Obviously, um, not very accurate chariots, but you know, sort of. It, it's a nice event um, put on. So I'm wondering, how were th how did they make three chariots? And um, are they Roman in appearance, or did they have to sacrifice a bit of appearance in order to be, in order to you know acquire chariots? They completely look Roman. They are they are Roman replicas, but they are not very authentic. Uh, their construction and appearance for for the like for for the uh, for the non archaeologists they look just as Roman as it possible. It just like brought so better than gladiator by, by a time machine. But those who and actually know a lot of about how ancient uh, um, these chariots quadrigai, bigai, were constructed. They will tell you that they are not the correct shape and size. Well, I think for this purpose, they were they were accurate enough. But, uh, but uh, they are not, ar ar archaeologically, they are not completely plausible. But that, that must have taken a lot of effort and money to, you know, to they, these chariots were built many, many years ago, not for this occasion. There are oh. there are approximately 10 chariots in Hungary. Then, so we could put on uh, huge races, but they are not all, all of them are not in the same city, not, not owned by the same museum. Most of them are in Savaria. I will use one of them if everything goes well. You know, I, I was awarded uh, with two triumphs that I can celebrate, and uh, and if everything goes well, I can do it uh, in the end at the end of August, and I will be using a chariot myself for that purpose, oh, wow. which will be the first ever actual reconstruction of a Roman triumph with all of its parts. So it's not just soldiers marching, or not just uh, soldiers carrying the trophies, the tropaeum but uh, with everything, the lictors, the magistrates, the priests, uh, chariot with the ge celebrating general, with the trophies and, uh, and soldiers marching after it with the complete uh, musician uh, band. Mu 
this is military music band. Well, I'm I've never heard of this. I mean, this is the first time, and uh, I'm I'm really excited. Um, <laughs> you can uh, come. You can, it's an it is scheduled on August twenty seventh and twenty eighth in Sombathely, which is the ancient Roman city Savaria. Hungarian name is Sombathely. It's almost at the Austrian border. Okay. I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind. I'm, I'm not sure what my schedule will allow then, but it sounds amazing. Um, just briefly, uh, there are safety protocols when chariots are racing, though, correct? Because obviously in ancient Rome, it's, it's a very dangerous sport. And these days, yes. we don't want anybody to get hurt. Yes, yes, uh, it's uh, very mild in comparison to the ancient one. The speed was reduced, not full speed, um, and uh, the racers didn't uh, hurt each other, didn't compete with each other very fiercely, and um, and in general, they did not strive so much for victory. They just tried to do the event and whoever wins so there was no um not a passionate competition they just wanted to go go the round safely and some of them just ended up winning but there was not an actual uh putting into putting into it everything and fighting for the victory style of race and did you have like the official counter um that shows every oh. lap Okay. No, no, we didn't have. We just uh, there was a how how should I say that uh, narrator who counted the who who spoke into spoke to the audience and and counted the, the turns as well, and um, but we had the the moment of the mappa being thrown thrown the the handkerchief that is thrown i threw it and this was the sign of the start that is a very important moment because uh, it's always commemorated in uh, reliefs and even statues the moment that the editor the magistrate who puts on the games throws the mappa well it, i mean it's such a pleasure to talk to you i, I get to learned so much not just about ancient rome but also nova roma and so many things that are going on um obviously uh i don't think there's anybody that knows as much about nova roma and what's going on as you um i'm wondering is it possible to maybe create some sort of calendar or or if there is you know to yeah. sh share a link because it definitely would be nice to know you know months in advance of events that are scheduled in case you know um yes it could work out yes it's absolutely possible if but we need a person who would do it i i just i just can't do everything it is, <laughs> oh, in, it's in, it is in itself a, a man's job to organize the calendar and make sure it's updated and and it researched in advance you know it's it's a part of being who I am, my personality, but it is also part of being uh, it's part of how it's possible to, uh, to function at all, not just for me but for anyone. That um, uh, these events are always being formed during the year, so I not I don't always know what's in the next month myself because because some events are either possible or not possible. For example, our participation in Rome, even the the big uh, uh, birthday of Rome, April twenty one, uh, which we discussed at the beginning of the video, even just two three weeks before the event, it was still a question whether we can go or not. So how could I uh, announce it in a large organization publicly that they should come and be there if I'm am not hundred percent sure that myself. Be, will be able to be there and our groups will be able to make it likewise the conventus it was unknown until like february 
the exact date when the Floralia will be held. So before February, we couldn't even know the dates. Organization couldn't start sooner as February. And when we know the dates, it was st- there was still there were there was still a little uncertainty whether we can make it international, whether we can obtain any enough participants from other countries. Because if only two countries come, then it would be embarrassing, and and we shouldn't advertise it as a conventus. So it is uh, my opinion that in a conventus, at least five countries must participate. I think. Now that I'm a senator, I, I will even propose in the Senate that for future conventuses, there should be a standard that if an event doesn't have a specific number of people from a specific number of countries, that may not be called a conventus of Nova Roma. Because if it ends up being just 10 persons, 10 people from two countries, uh, we are too large and too important now as an organization to to record it on our website and in our history that this was the whatever the, the 10th conventus of Nova Roma, the 10th international convention with 10 people and uh, with from two countries, then it would be just a bad uh, advertisement. So we have to make sure that this is a protected brand name within our organization, which events can be called as the great international conventus of Nova Roma. Now, so the, keeping these considerations in mind, uh, I had to make sure before I actively <clears throat> invite people and and uh, convince them to come <clears throat> that uh, I will be able to um, have enough variety, diversity, and uh, various nationalities among from among our members uh, here. Or, for example, and this will be the last example, the Tivoli event, which I'm going after tomorrow. I was not sure if I can go still at this weekend. So basically, this is, it depends on family, work, and on so many things that just to maintain, organize, and publish a calendar like this is a constant changing work with changes from week to week. So it's not not easy, not easy. I I don't say I don't say it's impossible. Of course, lots of organizations do it and have such a calendar, it's, and it should be done. I just wanted to point out that it's not it's not as simple as that. I write a list and publish it. It has to be taken care of and updated, maintained. And I didn't answer the other part of. Uh, the story, as I introduced, that it, it is partly my personality and partly the nature of the job. I talked about the nature of this this uh, task. But my personality, which comes into the picture, that I'm a very spontaneous person. I, I don't, I can't suffer strict schedules and I, I don't like to think about tomorrow. I always think into the moment, in the moment. So I usually don't know what I'm doing next week. <laughs> So for, I need a secretary for these kind of things, and and I don't have a secretary. So do the math. <laughs> so it, it for me it would it, I'm not the good person to to organize the schedule of Novaroma because I'm not that kind of person who is accurately maintaining times and dates. And so I, I the, we would need someone else for that kind of job. It's not not my thing. It's not it's not my strength to to do this kind of clerical work. Yeah, speaking of spontaneity, I remember that um, you actually went to Pompeii not too long ago. I, b- I believe it was last year. And I, and I've been there, I think, eight times. And, you know, they had some new buildings that are open to the public either for the first time ever or the first time in many years. And I offered to, you know, share some tips with you. And you're like, nope, I just want to walk around and just experience experience it on your own so, i was like okay then i won't give you any tips <laughs> yes yes well for the first time when i go to some very important place so of course not i don't do this for all places just for those which are very important for me i prefer to experience the pl- place and not to follow a schedule at all and when i return for the second or third time i'm i'm 
uh, doing a more uh, conscious uh, trip, uh, selecting certain specific places there that I want to see and want to watch more carefully in details. So, um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up pretty soon because um, it's actually pretty late <laughs> over here. Um, I actually had a few questions that I didn't ask you the previous time when we had the interview about an hour, uh, a year and four months ago. So, um, uh, and they were about, you know, the Latin language because obviously uh, you teach Latin and... Um, you're, you're a Latin scholar. So th there's a few questions that I, I wish I would have asked, but I didn't. But now, since I have the opportunity, you know, I, I would like to just uh, throw them out there. Um, first of all, I was wondering, um, because I was speaking with um, Stilicho um, just a few weeks ago, and he mentioned that... Um, you actually helped him with um, with late Latin. Uh, I, I believe I'm, I'm not sure if it, if it was a ritual or, or what, but um, yeah. And then then it got me to thinking about like the evolution of the language. I mean, how, how did it evolve from, for instance, the Archaic time to maybe Cicero's time? Because obviously that's a um, uh, he's a, he's a very well-known author. Uh, and then like, how, how did it like continue to evolve? For instance, you know, in Hadrian's time and to the latter half of the fourth century to, to, you know, the, the later Roman times. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just the nature of languages. It's, it's the most characteristic, um, property of any language that they constantly change. I would say that every, 50 years signal a change for the language and it's enough to for, for you as an english speaker english native speaker it's enough to open a book uh, comedy or or drama written by shakespeare how different is that from modern english it doesn't look so much different though than it it's actually because the English orthography is extremely conservative. English writes the words as they were pronounced half a thousand years ago. But in the time of Shakespeare, English words were almost actually pronounced exactly as they written. But since then, pronunciation changed a lot. But even if you just look at the Shakespearean English uh, vocabulary words and style of speaking, it uh, sounds, looks like uh, a very different language. But if you look back to English documents written around 1000, around the 10th century or 11th century, it starts to become unrecognizable, like a complete, like German. It starts to look like German, exactly. So that is just 1000 years. And Latin started approximately 3000 years ago. So. It's three times more changes. Um, would, so, would, Latin. Would have, okay. So, yes. if, if we if we remove the archaic part, and we just focus on Cicero to late fourth century, um, would that would the differences now be like reading Shakespeare, or maybe reading yes. like instead of Shakespeare, like eighteen? or like something from the 1800s, which is definitely more legible and understandable because I even have difficulties reading Shakespeare. Yes, uh, the comparison is very good actually because uh, approximately this is how fourth century Latin compares to Ciceronian once first century BC Latin, like modern English to Shakespeare in English. And, and, and the system of differences is similar because the orthography would look like almost the same, but the pronunciation would be different and the style. However, there is, a, there is one thing which would be less different and it is the style. The style of speaking, the diction didn't change so much between the time of Cicero and let's say, uh, 
Boetius, a late Roman author who lived uh, at the time of the fall of the Western Empire. So the difference between Cicel is almost unnoticeable for someone who is not into um, the study of literature. They both sound, uh, they both use uh, longer periods, periodical, how, how do you say it? Um, Hungarian, we call it uh, circle periods. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, it's a useful um, excursion for, for an English speaker, but the point is that the construction of sentences, the style, the diction is, is very similar, but uh, the, um, the pronunciation was different. And, and there, there were some new words which didn't exist in the time of Cicero. Heavy use of Christian terminology and all related ideas and concepts which were alien, would have been alien uh, in the first century before Christ. But uh, just like uh, the intention of the English um, orthography nowadays, today, is to keep the connection to the classical Shakespearean English was the same in ancient Rome that they wanted to keep the connection. They didn't want to declare, they didn't want to recognize that times have changed, many times have has much time, much time, time has passed, but they pretended that they are part of the same culture, they are part of the same community. And a tool for this uh, for, for, to maintain this unity was the protection of the orthography and style and grammar. And while the lower classes who didn't have the means to learn official grammar and, uh, and uh, elevated style, they couldn't maintain this difference. They couldn't maintain this um, um, original classical Latin style and grammar. But the elites could. So Latin basically separated into two different stories around the collapse of the Western Empire. The, the very high classes who could afford education and, and had grammarian teachers who imitated the classical Latin, uh, mostly in, in, in orthography and style, but not in pronunciation anymore. And the lower classes who couldn't, uh, who didn't receive such formal education, and and their Latin started to become a new language. After a while, so many differences occurred. Every fifty years, there was some kind of change, and after two hundred, three hundred years ago, these result in almost a new language. Oh wow. Very insightful. Um, so I'm wondering, out of curiosity, uh, what types of academic projects or papers have you worked on regarding Latin or translations or that sort of thing? Well, uh, I mostly participated in um, uh, history of language type of studies. My specific area is how ancient classical Latin changed into modern Romance languages like Italian, Romanian, French, Portuguese, Spanish. And I am part of a research research team which, which uh, works to uncover or all, all the details which are unknown. And uh, specifically, we make statistic, statistical uh, analysis on Latin inscriptions. We collect we collected almost all of the existing Latin translations, um, Latin inscriptions, and we register the grammatical mistakes, the orthographic mistakes, which are hints, traces of uh, changes, changes in pronunciation and grammar. And we uh, enter them into a database. And if we have enough number of data, which can be dated to exact years or at least two centuries, then at the end we will receive a very good guide about in which area, in which land, territory, 
in which region at one at which point in time did which type of changes occur <laughs> i'm not sure if my english uh, sentence had a good beginning and end but i hope i of course it did um so and at the at the end will will you publish a, a book or well, of course, Post yes. Workshops, yes. Or... We have already, all members of this research team have published many articles and studies, I myself included, for example, on the uh, Latin language of Aquincum, the, I mean, the vulgar, the, this is so-called the vulgar Latin. It implies in modern uh, meaning as obscene, but in linguistics, vulgar doesn't mean obscene. It means peoples, the low classes. The, lo the low class peoples Latin, the vulgar Latin of Aquincum and Pannonia and Noricum, Provincia Noricum, and uh, uh, northern Italy, Dalmatia, uh, and mostly, mostly the I researched the provinces uh, uh, around the, the Danube, the eastern part of the Danube because that's my research area and and my doctoral thesis is about the vulgar latin and and the development and history of the spoken latin language in uh, in the danube adria uh, alps region this triangle that is uh, bordered by northern italy and the alps and the danube river and um, and the adriatic sea so this will be my doctoral thesis, the complete history of Latin, uh, vulgar Latin developments and what signs, traces, indications point out to language development, language change uh, that point toward the new Roman languages like Italian, Romanian and the extinct Dalmatian because there was a Dalmatian language. It was something like uh, between Italian and Romanian. It sounded like a mixture of Italian and Romanian. This this language went extinct a little bit more than hundred years ago, and uh, and uh, we can know more about this as well by researching the late Latin dialects in the area. I definitely hope that uh, this thesis will be translated into English. <laughs> I will write it in English. Actually, I don't write oh, it in English. Yes, it, it's we have here. Hungarian is a small language, and it's not really worth writing anything substantial in Hungarian, because uh, it would have would be read by so few people. It's a waste of time. So I will write it directly in, in, in English. Excellent for me. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very very boring reading for a non linguist, but maybe excerpts with the with the most important parts will be interesting for the wider audience, but otherwise it will be a heavily uh, type of work written for those in the profession with lots of statistical data and uh, linguistic analysis. So I don't, I don't expect that many people will enjoy it, but the fruits of it will be popularized and, and will be used by even such people like reenactors, like Flavius Tilicu, who who could use already some of the re results of my research because uh, which I, you mentioned there was a reenactment event where he played emperor julian and he made a speech and he wanted to make it as authentic as possible so he asked me to to record a pronunciation and and write the text already in in a type of late roman vulgar latin and and I wrote it in a way, and I recorded the pronunciation that it sounded like, uh, as if it, ha it might have been uttered in the early fourth century. Amazing. Um, so now I'm at my very last question of the day. I mean, and it, it's been such a pleasure. But I know that uh, Latin has a very important role in Nova Roma. However, 
I, I don't actually speak Latin. And there's plenty of other people in Nova Roma that also don't speak Latin yet. Uh, obviously, if, you know, if somebody's attending school or university and have Latin classes, that would be a, a, an ideal situation. But m most of the time, you know, in one's adult life, um, you can't go back, you know, to college or school and take classes like you could when you were younger. So um, I've also seen, for instance, Scholastica um, has classes online, and I believe even Hortensia had some classes online, um, but that didn't continue just because of people couldn't commit, you know, to a certain time every week for a long duration of time. And that's actually my challenge because, um, you know, just things happen and you're busy and I can't, I can't commit, you know, let's say Tuesday evening or Saturday morning, you know, every week for the next 12 weeks. So I'm wondering how would you suggest someone in my situation or, or some similar situation to learn Latin, at least, you know, um, let, let's be ambitious here and say at an A2 level without any formal um, instruction or classes? Well, it's a little bit uh, asking for the impossible, but it's also possible, but you have to be lucky and very dedicated to make it so, to make it happen, because language learning is really a matter of uh, time dedicated to it. So there is no short way to learn a language because you forget it. If you don't use it, you forget it. You can maybe you learn something, and if you ju you just review it uh, one week later, you will have already forgotten about it, or you will forget it in the next week or a month later. So if you want to really know a language, it's not enough to dedicate one day to it in a week, but it should be learned every day, every day of the week, and and when you feel you are ready, you are not ready, then you have to constantly use it in order that you don't forget it. You have to read, or at least, best if you communicate in it, of course. But uh, most of the people who know Latin don't communicate in Latin a single word ever in their life. S still, they can maintain their, their Latin knowledge by, by reading constantly original authors or medieval Latin authors or modern Latin authors. So that, that's the beginning with which I wanted to start that it's, it's a little bit impossible to really learn any language, not just Latin, any language, if you don't do it on a constant daily basis. But, but you can still have some success and, 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 have, and you can ha have the chance to obtain a meaningful and, and useful amount of knowledge if you manage to steal somehow into your life moments, everyday moments of learning some Latin. Just an idea, for example, if you if you decide that you learn 10 words every week, you write it in somewhere which is or always near in your hands, like a paper in your pockets, or if you use a cell phone all the time, then a, a file, a very easily accessible file in your cell phone, and whenever you are bored, whenever you don't have anything to do, you look at on it. And it's best if they they are words out of which some sentences are formed as well. So, for example, let's suppose these words are um, good, good, uh, they, the wish, I, today, and family, your, for example, and then there are sentences made like, I wish you a good day. I wish your family a good day. Your family um, salutes, salutes me today. And these words are used as sentences, but also as a list of words. And what you do is to find just two, two minutes, three minutes, uh, multiple time during the day when you look at these words, you review the words, 
and you look at the sentences and you try to memorize these sentences and you do nothing but this for a week. And if it works for you and feel for starting from Monday and arriving on Sunday that you indeed can recognize and, and from memory cite these words and, and you can tell these sentences, then you can declare that you completed this and you start a new week with such a similar small endeavor. And week by week, you acquire 10 new words and three, four new sentences. And in 10 weeks, it's 100 words. And in, and in a year, it's, uh, it can cover most, the most frequent words of the language. And in every language, the first thousand words, the first first most frequently occurring thousand words, cover like uh, ninety percent of all texts, every text possible. If one can learn uh, the most frequent first thousand words of the Latin language, then that person can confidently read anything in Latin with the help of uh, a dictionary. And I don't mean like looking in the dictionary every minute. But um, you read, 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 and occasionally you have to check the dictionary. I think this is a journey that in two years can be made. So learning like this in this uh, um, tempo, that 10 weeks, 10 words a week, a few composed sentences. Of course, I realize this is not an easy thing to do because you need someone for you who selects the words prepares this list, writes the sentences. So unfortunately, you cannot do this. But I just demonstrated that in theory, this this is possible. You just need a book or a teacher or somebody who guides you in this journey. And I think it is quite effortless because you would just uh, spend several times, but just minutes on it during a day. So it, it would not feel like uh, uh, studying. It would just feel like uh, something uh, you do when you don't have, you have two minutes in a bus or in a train or in the elevator or somewhere. Yeah, I, I did a, a Latin for on Duolingo for maybe a month every day, but I realized that it's not, it's not really structured in a way that you learn. It structures it in a way that you could answer the questions correctly so i mean it, so i mean they don't give you grammar tables or this or that so that's why i think duolingo it was kind of fun to to learn some individual words but i i couldn't make actual sentences because there's no explanation with duolingo in that sort of a sense so would you would you steer someone for for instance to wheel locks i'm i'm not sure if that's the that's the the best material for self-learning, but it's definitely the most famous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is for for an, for a for for somebody who doesn't enjoy learning Latin and who doesn't like to sit down and to crunch through the tables of declensions and conjugations, and so I think this is the worst way to go because that person will get bored very soon and 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 i don't see it so for someone who wants to learn latin the easiest way possible a method like vlog doesn't sound to me plausible at all much more um this duolingo approach is, is the better but you would need a teacher to to help you through it because duolingo is the natural natural method of learning it teaches latin by practice you have to spend a lot of time on it but at one point you just you will just learn the rules without re realizing that you learn the rules this is the natural way of learning languages many people do that actually uh, we can oops we can sometimes see people who are not very smart not very bright they were not good in school but they go to work in a country you meet them a year later and they are fluent like like native speakers and when you ask them what is the subject of the sentence or what tense did you use they just love that they have no idea what is a subject and they have never heard about tenses 
but they speak impeccable way because they just imitate what they hear. And that's the most natural and most effective way of learning. You don't have to know any rules. You don't have to do anything. You just hear, you just let a trillion sentences and, and, and innumerable hours of uh, original speak flow through your brain. And it just makes it works without you knowing what happens. But for that effect, it's not enough to do Duolingo 10 minutes a day, but you have to do it hours and hours and hours and hours. And uh, we are back at the beginning where, where I said that really there is no short way to learn any language. The more time you dedicate on it, the better will you learn. There are natural geniuses who learn very, very fast and quickly, but uh, for the average or for those who are not especially good language learners, uh, big amount of time is, is a necessary thing. But I don't want to discourage anyone, those persons, those people who don't have enough time, they can still learn the basics. They can still enjoy, they can still get into a place where they can confidently say that they sense it as an, an, an achievement, a feeling that this is a Latin inscription there and I can understand it. So this is a very realizable state of uh, knowledge which doesn't necessarily require that many hours of study. So if your goal is to learn the basics and to be able to understand some inscriptions when you go to Roman sites, Roman, Roman places, that kind of knowledge wouldn't require so many hours. And to, to achieve that kind of knowledge, anything works basically because it's such a basic thing. You, you, for the most of what you should do is just to learn the most frequent words of Latin and to learn uh, the declensions, to memorize the declensions and then to practice it. At the moment, I cannot recommend a specific book for that purpose, but uh, there are books especially written for epigraphists to learn uh, to read inscription, inscriptions. I recall that you mentioned that you have or had such a book or have taken a look in, into such a book in the past. Yeah, I have one and it, it, I got it in England. So a lot of examples are um, inscriptions in England. And um, it, it's it's very interesting, just especially the abbreviations, because there there's so many different types of abbreviations. Yes, yes. Yes, that's a, that's a s separate art. A separate science uh, to know the abbreviations, so that that poses a new difficulty for the for the person wanting to learn. Because it, if you want to learn inscriptions, it's not enough to know Latin; you have to know the abbreviations as well, and you even have to know the font types, the letter types, because some letters and some so-called ligatures are not recognizable at uh, first sight for someone who didn't learn them. But again, it's a, uh, I wouldn't want anyone to feel discouraged by this so many difficulties and obstacles because I maintain what I said that, that it's possible for anyone to reach a point to feel satisfaction that they saw an inscription and could read it because there are very easily readable inscriptions and there are phrases in reenactment or in Roman events or in all things Roman that you can you can uh, really read with basic knowledge and have the kind of satisfaction that yes I can communicate at least a little bit with the Romans I, I have a small amount of satisfaction that I could read one of the most famous uh, Roman inscriptions. And that is when you go to the Pantheon, you could, yes. uh, you could read uh, who built it. Obviously um, uh, Agrippa didn't build the version of the Pantheon that you see. It was uh, Hadrian 
who uh, rebuilt it. But it's really interesting in that you know that he built it, and he was, I believe, he was a consul. And uh, yeah. yes, so Marcus Agrippa consul tertium fake it. That's the inscription. And, <laughs> exactly. And Agrippa cos uh, and the number three. Yeah, fake third it. time consul. Yeah. So, but it, that's one of the easier ones to to read. But um, anyways, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, I didn't think that we would speak for two hours, but here we are. <laughs> yes, it, time flew quickly. Maybe it's uh, almost three hours now. I, I'm not well, sure. One, two, the, two the, hours. The record. Yeah, well, the recording is a bit over two hours. But anyways, I it was su such a pleasure. I really enjoy it. Um, there's so many things that happened since we spoke last. And I'm sure in the next year or two, there'll be many other things that have come up. So maybe maybe we'll find time sometime in the future uh, to talk about, you know, even more incredible things going on with you yes. or with uh, Nova Roma. Yes, so. I could have... I could have uh, spoke uh, two hours just about the Conventus, and all the details <laughs> know, and, and, and little episodes and and the adventures we had there and the significance of uh, the words and uh, discussions that transpired. So yeah, it's it depends how deep we want to go into the details, but we can we can really talk to so many things. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a, a great uh, weekend in Tivoli. Thank you very much. I reciprocate your wishes and Wale. Wale. <laughs>